Right, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of the Northern Culture All-Party Parliamentary Group. Uh, I'm Jason McCartney. Uh, I'm a vice chair of this All-Party Parliamentary Group and uh, a very uh, warm but soggy welcome uh, from Westminster, it certainly is. And I've just rung my mum and dad back home in Huddersfield and it's soggy back up north as well. But thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're going to be here for an hour and a half. Uh, and we're doing this uh, session uh, with a number of fantastic speakers, uh, this evidence session. Uh, I will be introducing uh, the speakers and then there will be plenty of opportunity to uh, ask questions uh, later. So the focus of today's session is about youth uh, participation in sport. Look, we all know, I'm a big sports fan, that sports can play a massive role in community, bringing uh, young people together, bringing communities together. It's not just the health and well-being and exercise, it's the camaraderie, the team spirit, the, the, the sense of being. And certainly I engage with very many uh, grassroots uh, sports clubs and groups uh, in my Con Valley constituency back up in Yorkshire. They also have amazing cultural value as well. Um, both my professional rugby league club, Huddersfield Giants, and Huddersfield Town Football Club uh, are both engaged in things like the National Citizen Service. They also help de uh, deliver the Holiday Activities Food Fund Programme, which is where the government fund them to give uh, kids sporting activity through the summer and also a healthy, nutritious meal as well. And I visited many of those projects during the summer to actually see uh, how they, how well they're being delivered uh, in our communities. So we're going to hear opening remarks then from uh, two panels, and then I and the other parliamentarians will have an opportunity uh, to ask uh, follow-up questions. The exercise today, of course, is to inform, uh, it's to uh, complement and enrich the evidence uh, which we're gathering, and it will all feed into a report which is being written by the University of Sheffield, which will be published uh, next year. Just very, very quickly, um, let's just look again quickly at the questions of the inquiry. We're asking what is needed to both boost the cultural value of sport and build stronger communities across the North. We're asking how much more cultural value could sport add to leveling up opportunities and access to culture? How can sport drive cultural value, identity and diversity and contribute to the North's rich scene of talent and also help grow the North's uh, economy. So we have two great panels today and each will be answering their own key questions. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping though please, the session is being recorded and it will be shared online in due course. I really am wanting to encourage you all, please do uh, get involved uh, and raise any questions for our speakers in the chat bar. You can also join the debate online using the hashtag Northern Culture Inquiry. And uh, if you're on social media, you can tag in at NCAPPG, NCAPPG, that's the Northern Culture All-Party Parliamentary Group. Now, with further ado, let's uh, kick off then. Um, we're starting off with John Downs, who is the North East Director of Street Games. Street Games harnesses the power of sport to create positive change in the lives of disadvantaged young people right across the UK. Street Games' work helps to make young people and their communities healthier, safer and more successful. John, over to you. Uh Thanks very much, Jason, and, and thank you for having me speak today at this uh, meeting and what is a, for us a really important topic and a, and a really key topic to address. Um, I think, you know, you've covered there what um, Street Games does uh, in, in a really, really succinctly for us, which is great. I think, you know, we've been around about 15 years and, and we've got a network of about 1,400 organisations and, and well over 50% of those are in the north. It's kind of our heartland in a way. And from the north, we started off in 2007 in 
activity in 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 and around the north uh, west in Manchester and Liverpool, and then in the north east and around Newcastle and Sunderland. It's been a key area of of work, and we focus on those areas of high deprivation and poverty. When looking at this, the questions you raise um, and our response to this kind of a question of sport and levelling up, I'm drawn to the first two questions about what's needed to boost the cultural value of sport and um, what, how much more cultural value could sport add to that in terms of our response. I think what our evidence shows and the work we've done over the last 15 years is, is sport can really help generate two key things around boosting communities there's an element of human capital so what it can build some boost around the individual around their people's knowledge and skill but also the the social capital the communities the connections the relationships in local communities and actually through effective designed sports programs in those local communities you can really generate um a stronger social inf infrastructure for young people to benefit from in a time when some of that is is not necessarily there based upon a number of factors. So it's an element of, of building um, a kind of community atmosphere where sport is that glue coming together. And we use a, an, a methodology we call doorstep sport that's been developed over the last kind of 15 years that looks at um, a number of ingredients to develop the, the opportunities for young people. And what we know is that through effective design of programmes, you can really use sport to build about um, in, not just increasing people's participation, but taking part, being active citizen that is, is in citizens in their community. You can try and open them to new horizons, improve new things. It's about improving friendships, about improving well-being, about creating a more committed habit in life. But actually, there's an element of leadership and volunteering, and we see through our work a huge element of people taking a more active part in their their community the kind of broader culture of where they live and build, it, build engagement and relationships. Um, so it, ultimately, there's a kind of model for us around effective community sports. Sport can play a huge role in that initial element. Um, but really, we need to think about access. And for us, if we're going to boost the opportunities for young people and boost the cultural values or boost the youth participation sport, we need to think about the access for children and young people in sport. And that for us is via local embedded organisations, organisations with the skills, relationships and capacity to support and build local opportunities. And they use their this Dorset sport methodology. And one recent example, one of the things in the report talks about people's kind of access to part to, to be audiences in sport, to access opportunities. And, and we've just done some data crunching in the last year alone through things like the Women's Euros and the Rugby League World Cup, which is still ongoing. We've helped about 10,000 young people from those communities access those events to see live sport, to see live sport in a way that they wouldn't normally be able to afford to go. And therefore, how you can build upon that, because they get the opportunity to soak up that atmosphere, to stand in a massive stadium, to watch sport that they wouldn't normally think. And then it twigs a chance to say, well, what more can I do? Can it boost my participation and engagement? That's not the only way, but that's one of the ways we look at it. And that we really think that critically about embedding participation through those local organisations, which will be arranged on the course today, and people speaking today will be those local organisations with the relationship is absolutely critical. They're what we call our local and trusted organisations. And we've, we've recently launched a commission the Charles Webster Batson Commission that talks about the importance of those local LTOs. Um, and so what we would look at in terms of kind of where we're at is advocating that there's something about using place-based approaches that is already there, targeting funding into place-based approaches and recognition for those local organisations are absolutely critical to building the community atmosphere and the access for those young peoples. Young people, but if we're thinking about in boosting the participation and boosting the access into sport and the value of sport, we need to think about the access and hence who is best placed to provide the access to those children and young people.
Thank you, John. That's uh, a really good start. I was just making some notes of some questions that I want to ask you uh, later on, which is absolutely brilliant. So that's a, a really, really good start. So uh, get ready for lots of questions later, John. Uh, let's get on to our second uh, panellist then, who is Paul Walmsley. He's Research Fellow in Children's Rights and Social Justice at the University of Liverpool and Executive Researcher at Nobody Left Behind. Now, Nobody Left Behind is a community interest company with a focus to engage with young unemployed people and disadvantaged families through the power of sport. And they're committed to supporting unemployed 16 to 25 year olds into sustainable and meaningful employment. And with that experience, Paul, I can see exactly why you're on our panel today. Over to you, Paul. Hi, thanks Jason. Uh, so yeah, being from Liverpool, it's soggy here. Uh, it's really soggy here. Uh, and you mentioned culture in it, and obviously you've got a name like McCartney, so I can't carry on the conversation and not mention, you know, how, how much of a culturally embedded city we are at, at Liverpool. Um, football's massive. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey of how I've got here, and then I'll tell you about the journey about where I want to go with this. So I started off as a uh, teacher in the Jamie Carragher Sports and Learning Academy. I then became the director of, the, of that academy for five years. And I realised that I didn't want to judge young people by academic value. So I left and got myself a job in Liverpool University. I don't know how that happened, but it did. From that, I then worked in several alternative provisions around the city, looking at young people and how they felt marginalised and realised that school wasn't for everyone, education wasn't for everyone. And we have a one-size-fits-all sort of education system where, where these 15% of needs and marginalised young people uh, were falling through all the gaps. So we, we decided to set up a, a little bit of a safety net and we went in three schools in uh, deprived areas in Liverpool which usually is about a percentage of 15 to 20% of the cohorts, which are uh, deemed, as I say, uh, unruly and disruptive within the classroom. We took them out of the school environment and we took them to a boxing gym. So we used boxing as a conduit for them to express themselves to us, to, uh, to have relationships with other people outside of school, but in school time, which they felt was important. At the time, I thought it was a little bit of a waste of time because what we were seeing then is when kids got to the age of 16 and they still didn't want to go to college and they were having all that disruption, still with their parents, with their carers or whoever looked after them and with the people who were trying to educate them, we decided then to set up a, a, a virtual college where we could upskill and manoeuvre these young people and other disadvantaged peoples into getting employment because in Liverpool, we, you know, as well as having a great culture, we also have a, 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 a criminal culture as well. And I think our philosophy now is that relationships, jobs and families stop bullets. So with that philosophy, we built a seven week programme where we engaged with uh, young people and ex care leavers, ex prison leavers, offenders, we, deal, uh, we, de we dealt with women in the Muslim community who felt marginalised to set up uh, where we use sport, to set up uh, a, a way of them feeling uh, healthy, looking at their well-being and then their self-esteem. So we do sport with them for the first four weeks. We have professional coaches. We have Natasha Jonas. We have Ricky Lambert. We have Jamie Carragher. Uh, we have three professional boxing gyms within the area. And after the four weeks, we then upskill them in low-level construction and civil engineering skills. We have, a, I think now, 14 companies on board with us. Because at the end of the seven weeks, we have what's not... It's like speed dating for employers and for these people to come and have conversations with people who might want to take them on and usually do take them on. So that's exactly what we do now but we're still in schools as well. So we identify the people through sport and through using other cultural assets as well by using actors, musicians, because there's a huge step in, especially in, in criminology with the desistance theory of how to desist in that behavior through being creative. And I think sport and creativity are, are, are really, really, really related 
in terms of you mentioned teamwork early on and anyone who's been in a band or been a mu musician will know what it's like you know your timing has to be spot on <laughs> yeah your notes have to be spot on and, and, and also working with other people and also being able to take some criticism as well uh, so that's what we do at nobody left behind we try our best not to leave people behind and we also as well as my role at the university as being a children's rights researcher uh, I look after the Young Persons Advisory Group there and we try and make research meaningful and purposeful in the area so we can actually use it to inform policy, which we did at the Child of the North paper, which was released, uh, I think, last year, which we went to a select committee and delivered that to Parliament. And it wasn't until a young person actually got up and spoke in front of, I think, about 15 MPs that the room and the mood changed. So I, I wish we would have had some more young people on here today to tell us their experience but I think for me, looking at the questions and how we can do it and how we can help, I mean, levelling up and austerity and rebalancing, these are all just words to the people we work with. They, they, they seem that transparent, that there's nothing there. So we try and give them some meaning and some feeling and some purpose. So jobs for us is absolutely massive and putting money in the pocket of young people, but also teaching them that you know about their area about their culture about these people in sport and in music and in, in, in theater and in acting and tv who've come through all of this adversity and who've now landed on the other side because i don't think there's anyone on this screen or in this meeting who hasn't had some problems in their life you know and it's about sharing these stories as well so it's not just about the sport the culture it's also about storytelling there's a lot to this i could stay here forever and ever and ever and talk to you forever because I do talk for a living, obviously. Uh, but I'm going to be quiet there and obviously invite questions later on. So thanks for listening and thanks, Jason. Uh, cheers, Paul. I could listen to you forever, uh, to be honest. Forever. I see, forever. love your enthusiasm. Uh, yes, uh, and I'm not related to Paul, and, unfortunately, but I, I do get asked that quite a lot. No, cheers, Paul. Look forward to asking you some questions later. So let's just hear from our, our final panellist at, at this point. Uh, of our morning session then. So the third of our three panellists at this stage then um, is Dagan Irak, who's a sports sociologist uh, at the University of Huddersfield, where I worked uh, for two years. Good morning, Dagan. And I wonder, are you actually in your office at the university or are you working from home in a yes. very spare bedroom? Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's my office <laughs> uh, with the beautiful drawings of Alice Lowry, one of the uh, all-time greats of British arts, and also football-related, sports-related arts, and working-class related arts. So uh, I would like to thank you all for inviting me, receiving me in uh, this very important event. I, I, I. I think my inclusion in this event is very relevant to what I'll be uh, talking about. I'll be talking about democracy and how democracy is all about inclusion and uh, how we can contribute to our democracy in the United Kingdom and all over the world by using sport in a positive direction. Uh, in an inclusive direction. So uh, uh, this is very important for me to be here because I'm not a UK citizen. I'm an immigrant in this country. I've been living here for three years. And I was one of the uh, almost 90,000 lucky people who witnessed the Linus's uh, victory at Wembley uh, a couple of months ago. And well, uh, even though I'm a sports, uh, sports sociologist, and before that I, 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 I'm a women's football sports commentator, I worked for Eurosport for, for over 10 years, it was still surprising to feel that it was the moment I felt the most included in this community because we felt the same joy over the lines as when. Um, so democracy is all about inclusion and exclusion. The, uh, the, the, the decisions that you take uh, about including certain people and excluding others 
would eventually define what kind of democracy that you are. And it's uh, sport is a very, uh, very indicative, very reflective uh, area in measuring a country's uh, or a region's democratic culture. Uh, but, you know, participation to sport, it doesn't happen automatically. Democratizing sport is not an automatic process. Actually, if you leave sport into its own course without supporting it with uh, relevant policies, you will see that there might appear a huge power gap between those who have and those who have not. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a question that we need to ask ourselves uh, nationwide and also in local level, if there is this divide and if we are doing enough to reduce this divide, if there is. And uh, we are we all live in the uh, nor uh, north of England and we all know that there is a massive gap uh, between this part of the country and the south part of the country. So obviously there's a general divide, uh, social divide and economic divide uh, between different regions in this country. And in our region, uh, I think we can ask ourselves the question, are we including everyone in democracy related processes and also in sport related processes? Is our, is, is our sport environment democratic enough that it would include different ethnicities, different genders, different uh, social classes? So uh, my observation is we, we, we are not there, not yet. Uh, but my other observation is we don't have enough data. So we should start, I mean, I'm an academic, so I will always uh, wait for the data to arrive to, to comment uh, more conclusively about things. And we don't have that data. So we need to talk to people. We need to canvas the most underprivileged areas of our, uh, of our region to find out who is excluded from sports and for what reason. Uh, and when I say sport, I'm not just uh, talking about practicing it, because you will see that many people will not pr practice sport, but they will still contribute to the sport world in different capacities. And equal or fair representation is very important in that matter as well. Um, for example, I never played sports, but I'm a sports sociologist. I used to be a sports journalist, so it was important for me to understand sports. And that was how I could contribute to democratizing the sport environment coming from a working class uh, family. Um, and for many people in underprivileged areas of uh, this region, maybe we don't have the next uh, I don't know uh, Sterling or uh, or we don't have the next uh, prodigy of uh, rugby league or cricket, but maybe we have the best sports journalist that would contribute to the debate. Maybe we will we are we have the best referee among us uh, as a young person. So are we giving those people enough chances, and are we asking them? if they feel included. So I think uh, we need more qualitative data and also we need more outreach. Uh, and as the uh, sports journalism course leader here at the University of Huddersfield, I wanted to develop a project, a pilot project in order to uh, test the waters, uh, so to speak, uh, in, in that potential. So right now we are developing a project uh, with uh, Huddersfield Town uh, Folk Club Women's Section uh, to 
organize uh, women's football clinics and also uh, sports journalism clinics for uh, female students in underprivileged areas of, of Kirklees. And uh, we are trying to at least show that they, they have a chance to be included. And we are trying to create some channels. Uh, it's a very uh, early project, but we are we are uh, we are considering to develop ways if we can find uh, enough uh, funding to create a sports journalism scholarship for for women uh, for female students, uh, so they could be included. Because I'm the sports as the sports journalism course leader, I'm really uh, to be honest, annoyed by the fact that our student cohort is predominantly uh, male students, and it doesn't contribute enough uh, to the democratization of this environment. So I think we need to, to sum up, I think we need to first find out who is included, who is excluded, and for what reason they are excluded, then we need to address the issue by developing policy and projects. Thank you. Uh, Dagan, thank you uh, very much indeed. So three fantastic uh, panelists there. Um, certainly just picking up on what you finished there, certainly, you know, getting girls into sport and activities. I have two teenage daughters. Um, and, and they've had sort of uh, spurts of enthusiasm uh, over the years. Um, and, and I think there's the balance between sort of um, representative sport, playing for a team, and then doing some activity and enjoying it um, and enjoying the sort of friendships, um, of the fresh air and, and the physical activity, really. Um, so I, I said I've come from Yorkshire. Um, I've had two previous careers, actually. I joined the Royal Air Force straight from school, uh, and sport was always very important uh, in the Royal Air Force for 10 years. Every Wednesday afternoon uh, on the RAF bases, uh, we'd have a sports afternoon, and everyone had to take part in, in some kind of sport or whatever. Um, and even if I was playing rugby, I'd be playing alongside someone like Tony Underwood, who you may remember was an England winger, for England Rugby Union. He was a flight lieutenant uh, in the RAF. I was a flight lieutenant in the RAF as well. Um, and then I went on to be uh, cover sport as a journalist, actually. I was at ITV uh, in Leeds, ITV Yorkshire. I covered politics and sport. Um, there's a lot of sort of similar threads of issues running through both of them, as we've heard. And um, one of the big stories I used to cover was the emergence of the boxing gym in Sheffield at Winkerbank, Brendan Ingalls' gym with Nazim Hamed, uh, and basically Brendan, who is a wonderful gentleman and his son's taking it on now, um, realised that there was a whole group of uh, youngsters that we've just been talking about that was sort of missing out on society. So he set up this gym in Winkerbank in Sheffield uh, and all these you know, scrawny young kids came along, got involved in boxing, and one of them was Prince Nazim Hamed, who went on to be uh, a, a world champion. The gym's still going. Um, and, and it's still getting youngsters in there and they've really branched out now. And of course, girls and women are getting into boxing as well. So, but I saw firsthand how that gym uh, transformed the lives of, of, of so many young people. Uh, and it wasn't just the, the bodies, the physical activity, it was what's going on up there as well. And I know it set many of them up for life uh, and gave them the confidence and the impetus to go on and get jobs, careers, uh, set up in families. Um, so uh, I'm just looking at some of the questions uh, that have come up uh, in the uh, chat bar. Um, I'm not quite sure, Lewis, whether they can actually jump in themselves or whether I'm going to be asking the questions uh, on uh, their behalf. Uh, but I know, for example, uh, we've got uh, Andrew McPhillips from the Northern Powers Partnership. I'll bring you in in a moment, Andrew, but just scrolling up through the questions, um, I'm having a look here. Duncan McVeigh, I'll ask uh, his question on his behalf, um, if our three panellists can have a think about this question. So Duncan said, I think there's a business case 
for increased use of technology in grassroots sport and for regulation and standardization of the activities at local grassroots clubs. There's a variety in quality and motives against grassroots sports activities and the costs that are involved disenfranchise the poorest kids from getting involved. So Duncan's a uni lecturer and a grassroots uh, sports coach. He does cricket and football. And he also adds he's got an MSc in, in, in sports business as well. So this question about uh, standardization, uh, about uh, what's delivered, uh, how, how do you assess the quality uh, and also uh, the cost? You know, I mentioned the holiday activities food fund. So Huddersfield Town ran uh, football clubs through the summer at their training ground. The, the kids that were on free school meals were in the same groups as those that were paying for their session through the summer. Of course, they weren't identified. Nobody knew who they were. Um, so they were getting access to high quality uh, training uh, and activities through the summer alongside those kids that have been able to pay. So it seemed to work really well. Nobody know, knew who the kids were on the, on the free places uh, and they were just, just alongside those. John, is there something that you want to say on that area, please? Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and it's interesting you mentioned the Holiday Activity and, activity and Food Programme. I've been around that programme since 2018 when it was a pilot programme. So currently Street Games manages the programme in Birmingham, Derbyshire, and we support about six or seven of the local authorities. So I'm well versed in the, the holiday program. And I think there is a, a lot of learning in that that we use around reviewing the quality of the program. I think there's something interesting about what, first of all, yes, there is a, there is a case of technology and it can really help providers and organizations. I think sometimes when we consider technology and some of those young people with the street games are working and probably that Paul might be working with, you're talking about an, a, a digital access problem. There is a huge access and, and we have been doing some work with young people recently did some we've been doing some what called design sprints and 50 percent of the young people we talk to in there don't have access to wi-fi at home so if you're talking about digital technology young people some people have got access to wi-fi at home they haven't got access to gaming technology the reason they go to youth clubs and organizations is because they get access to wi-fi they get access to games machines that they don't have at home I think we need to consider what the term grassroots sport is as well, because you can think about grassroots sport as your local football club, your local rugby club, the place where I'm a coach at a rugby club up in the northeast. You know, for street games, when we talk about our network, we're talking about community organisations, CICs, local youth organisations, potential local authorities. It was mentioned later in the questions about Premier League sport. We talk about football clubs. We're talking about organisations that are embedded in communities with trust, usually with some form of paid staff members or employees, but they might only be part time or whatever. Um, because they provide very low cost or free at the point of access for this captivity, a different network than your local rugby club, your local football club. Our setup was always on the basis that in those areas, young people have 50%, the areas of poverty deprivation, we know from the research that young people have 50% less access to those um, sports clubs and, and local sports clubs because of the lack of venues, the lack of clubs, the lack of volunteers, the, la in, the lack of funding to be able to run those clubs because essentially those clubs are run by people paying membership fees. So if you haven't got the money to pay membership, then you're not going to have a club in place. So these other organisations, this other alternative you want, like grassroots, are vital at providing your services, but they do need resourcing to provide those activities. But with that, because you're funding them and you're providing them funding, maybe through programs, Jason, like the HALF program, you have an element to make it may develop quality. You have an element to fund people in training. You have an element to put frameworks in place to say, this is what we expect, or this is what we're funding you to do. So Dorset Sport, as I say, has got a, whole set of ingredients which has you know 10 areas to it with sets of standards and we you know training courses associated with that to make sure that people are delivering quality and then essentially repeat funding for those organizations is on the result of reaching the right audiences delivering the impact you're after um, and that grassroots delivery is ultimately the research we're finding needs investing in if we're really to engage those 
young people in those communities and what those organisations provide that, and it's a bit what you said about your daughter groups and girls that we've developed in those girls programme. It's about the, where they have the relationship with an adult who, or a trusted adult. They have the trust of those people there and they have that kind of affinity to do it. So it could be that it, if you're not sporty but you want to do sport, going to the football club is not for you, but going to your community centre that's being run by a local person who you know may be the person that gets you engaged in sport and physical activity. And what our local organisations do is provide that relationship, that trust for those, that engagement for those uh, those local young people to engage with activity. Yeah, I, I'll come on to Paul in a second. Yeah, visiting my half projects during the summer, it was good to see that they were doing like bushcraft um, and, and sort of making their own pizzas and then cooking them on a campfire uh, and archery and things as well. So it wasn't sort of hard level sport because we've got to remember of course that sort of you know team sport isn't for everybody and it's it's how to get those um kids that have a sort of mental block about that side of things um can actually get involved uh, as well paul i want to bring you in on this and i was particularly interested as well when you said you go into uh schools uh how do you get to go into the schools do you invite yourself in is it hard to get into the schools do they invite you in and then how do you identify the kids that you're going to focus on? And then obviously whatever you wanted to say as well, please. Cheers, Jason. Uh, usually I'm invited in. Uh, I can't get in there forcefully because you have the pit bull receptionists who you can't get through. And, 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 and that's, that's another sort of realms of, I don't know, it's like Game of Thrones getting past the uh, <laughs> receptionist. Uh, there's a couple of points that I want to hit upon, and there was a couple of questions. Uh, Ed Pertrud has made one in, in the chat, and I'll get to that in a minute. But there was one about the with the increase of, of technology and how how it could be used or how it could be better. And he only mentioned that an event on Friday. Uh, it, it's not just technology, it's resources that major organisations have, like universities, like uh, the, the fire brigade at their services, like the bus and the train services in the area, they can also help. Um, what we've done at Liverpool University, because we're going to be a UNICEF child-friendly city soon, we've asset mapped all our resources. And for the last year, I have been out into the wider community to see what groups can use these assets when the university is closed. So for instance, it, there's a huge rise in three-on-three -three basketball at the minute. Uh, it's a huge game. There's leagues becoming uh, known nationally. So the university are, are now getting rid of some of their big basketball pitches, changing them to a three-on-three -three version, and they're now giving us the uh, the pitches free of cost to get marginalised, uh, disadvantaged young groups to come in and use them. So that's that's been a big plus for me. And that was with being part of the governance team on the Child Friendly City, see how it works. I mean, Liverpool City Council is in disarray at the minute. I mean, I have, I have a saying, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it out loud. It could be seen to be viewed as Naples with a Beatles wig on at times. And it's, it's, it's for me, it's sickening as a scouser and a proud scouser to see that, but that's just the way it is. But if we don't try and repair it, no one will, and we are, we are trying. But getting back to Ed Perchin's message about what are the Premier League doing, what we've just done with Everton Football Club and with the PFA, I'm going to tell you a, a story which I know. There is a 19, uh, in, in 1990, 1990-91, I'm not sure if it's 92, if you go to live, or if you went to Liverpool's old training ground, there, would, uh, there was a picture of that team, the youth team on the wall, and there was a squad of 22 and 18 of them went to jail. The reason why they went to jail, because they dipped off so their expectations, their life had just crumbled and there was nothing to pick them up. So now the PFA have come to us because they've seen we've got this model that actually works. Everton Football Club have as well. So all the uh, academy drop-offs from this year are now coming with us and we're going to upskill them and we're going to get them into jobs. Hopefully we'll, we're going to get them into really good jobs as well as, as as low level jobs, but sometimes that's where you have to start. So there is things being doing uh, and things happening uh, at the moment, but it's like anything, it's small. And what the problem that we've got as an organization, that's nobody left behind. 
not the university, is that we're, we're mainly funded by the uh, Home Office DWP and the VRP, which is the Violent Reduction Programme or the Violent Reduction Unit. But in two years' time, that's not going to be there. So we're, we have to sustain ourselves. So what we've just made a conscious decision to do is all the profits we've made over the past 12 months, we're reinvesting that in a care home. We're going to take young people who are marginalised and disadvantaged, we're going to help them through sport, uh, in semi-assisted living, and all the profits of that are going to be fed back into nobody left behind, so we can be sustainable to what we want to do, and that's our model, and that's how we see us moving forward. But we do need businesses, we do need government help, we do need funding, but it's difficult at the minute, and it's only going to get more difficult with the present climate. And, and Paul, can you just answer that question for Med Perchard? He's speaking about Everton and their free school, obviously. You know, I don't know whether you're a blue or a red. Um, but- I'm a massive red, so I'm going to decline that offer of a of talking about Everton Football Club. No, no. <laughs> to, to be fair, Everton really do well in the community, and the, the teams up with John Moore's University, uh, Edgehill University, and now John Moore's University. And I think that's the model I looked at when I was running Jamie Carragher's Academy, and I thought, wow, this is a good model to do. But what they what they had, they had loads of volunteers in, in the area to to actually do what they're doing. He's talking about the new ground as well, which is Lango Roker building that. Now, we now feed into Lango Roker with apprenticeships. So we're trying to work with the, the, the major tier one construction companies as well. We had a meeting, and I know some of the uh, uh, the staff have organised this meeting with Atkins, who are the biggest engineering company. Now, I hope they're going to start a scholarship with us, but we only want to start something small and to grow it from that small acorn. We don't want nothing big from these big companies or from the Premier League or from the PFA. What we want to do is create something sustainable where we can give jobs, but where we use sport as a conduit because it's, you know, sport, music and culture is massive, especially being a proud scouser. I'm not going to burst out into song, but I will at the end if you ask me. No, um, I might do at the end, actually, Paul. uh, uh, Dagan, I'll just bring you in on uh, this this point as well. Um, I I keep referring to the fact that... um, you know, how, how do we identify and encourage those kids um, that aren't participating and, and having access to all this uh, positive activity? I mean, as a kid, I did everything. I did scouts, I did cadets, I did Duke of Edinburgh's. Um, I had something on every evening, uh, every afternoon, every weekend. And as I said, when I go around community groups in my patch, I can actually name them. I keep running into the same six or seven kids that do everything. Um, so, but I'm always mindful there will be some still at home, maybe just watching TV, just sitting on their phones, uh, playing computer games, uh, and not out there. Um, as a sports sociologist, how, how do we access get get to those young people? Uh, and and get them out and, and participating. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, I I think the most important thing is to talk to people, and uh, that's why we need more field work. And I feel sports sociologists play a huge role, should play a huge role, and they should be. Uh, they should be working alongside city councils and local governments and also national governments, sports bodies, uh, in order to, to, to really canvas those areas. Because, you know, uh, it's important to know where we have a very specific lack of data. And it's usually a good indicator of where inclusion is not really on par because even if even when you don't have data about anything you know that other things are neglected as well so uh we really need field work we need we need to uh develop research projects on on canvassing on researching on how, uh, on different communities, different uh, groups, different underprivileged groups, uh, often groups discriminated against, 
uh, because you know at the end uh, I, I will repeat this at the end of whatever you do about inclusion in sports you are actually doing for your own democracy because they are being included in the community uh, and it's it's really uh, a very important and very uh, neglected uh, component of uh, social coherence No, cheers, cheers, Dagan. I'm just looking through the questions here. I think we've got um, Andrew McPhillips from the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. Good morning, Andrew, and everybody else on the call. We've got lots of people on this call. Uh, Andrew, would you like to ask a question, please? Hopefully you're unmuted. I uh, hope so, Jason. Uh, thanks for the, uh, for the invite to ask a question. Um, I think it touches on something that you asked Paul um, a little bit earlier, and I was, I was interested to listen to what you were saying, Paul, about um, the kids that perhaps can't engage with the, the current curriculum at school um, and that it's quite, you know, some people might view it as quite narrow and it perhaps underplays the importance of sport um, and some creative subjects, which means that some kids struggle to engage um, in, in a regular school day. So part of the work that we do at uh, Northern Powers Partnership, we focus quite a lot on the most disadvantaged communities and we know there's quite a significant gap in the educational achievement um, of pupils in in those places and from those backgrounds compared with their peers and that schools struggle quite a lot because the issues that the kids are facing go well beyond the school gates um, and we know that sport can be one of those avenues where kids can can pick up and learn other important life skills about leadership and teamwork and lots of stuff that they struggle in a school environment sometimes so the question is kind of how involved um you and john probably the same question how involved you are in in kind of helping those kids and fitting in with the education sector, um, potentially being able to access funding because we, we're used to public sector working in silos quite often. I think you mentioned DWP and the Home Office funding you. How joined up some of those conversations are because we've seen examples, I think North Birkenhead is one where we're starting to look at some of the, as these kids bringing all agencies together that are dealing with their lives to have a proper conversation rather than lots of one-off specific, spe specific interventions without you know all those all those organizations actually speaking to each other to figure out how the kids are progressing so it'd just be good to know how you kind of fit into that whole community i guess can i answer that jason yeah uh yeah i was going to bring you in first paul way to go now so uh i, th I think what we have we in, in in the lives of them young people that we're talking about we have chaos and we don't need to to add more chaos to their lives what we need to do is when you have, say, a lash meetings, I mean, it, 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 I, felt like, I felt like I was in a religious quarter and we were at the, 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 the 12 stations of Christ when, when, when we went to do one meeting with, with, for one young person. There was too many people there. <clears throat> when it, it takes somebody who can think on their feet with some nous who will be able to navigate through, who then the family trusts the young person trust and someone from local authority trust because what we've got we've got policy and procedure which is now harming our young people it's now we protect them too much that everyone becomes uh sort of risk averse and oh i can't do this and and, and then you get adults who then protect their job and and i think we have to really look at that as well as a society uh, so and, and I always say, especially being the children's rights researcher and especially working in schools, the rights of the adults sometimes top trumps the rights of the child. And we have to look at that massively. Yeah, John, please jump in. Yeah, I, I, I do completely agree with what Paul says. And I think it, it challenges what we talk about, about the, the role of the trusted adults within within the lives of young people, that those and, and, and who the family trust sometimes if the young person hasn't got that family support the the the, the one the, the the adults the young person just who can do that navigating on their behalf I agree sometimes you I sit in multi ancient meetings and you can have too many people around an individual young person it becomes overwhelming I think taking a step back in that place in the sector I think it's come up in the chat around questions I think one of the things that you're able to do and we've been doing with some areas particularly with, through the violent reduction units and police and crime commissions is starting that kind of mapping of things like education uh, deprivation rates crime rates and social behavior rates and overlaying 
provision to access of services and organizations going actually where are the cold spots where are the hot spots where are the, the places that young people have access to to start to map out well a where is the provision and then you start to understand what people's access is no kidding. And, and for us it's about organizations having a role in coordinating that it can't just happen without coordination we play a role in helping coordinate that we have examples now where we're starting to develop a kind of real combined strategy that's not owned by, and I love what Paul's saying, not owned by the City Council. We've got an example in Newcastle that there's a new eight-year strategy called Every, which is about a commitment of all partners owned by a number of organisations. And the City Council's job is to facilitate that. They're, they're the secretariat, but the Every campaign is owned by the university, street games, the, the football club, to say we are all committed to making sure every time and it's like a public statement of commitment then we're held to account by the rest of that group and i think it takes a brave bold step to say we have to be thinking differently and we have to think about reaching those children and young people who have less access because as as dagan says those who have less access to sport have less access to lots of other things as well and therefore how do we create the mechanism and the landscape to say there is fair and equal access because that can boost their opportunity into, as was asked, back into education or into employment. It might not be employment in sport, but can sport be used as a tool to boost confident self-esteem relationships that helps them think about, I can get a job somewhere else. I can engage in other services. But ultimately, we need to think bolder and braver about getting people to commit. There is so much need that you need in an area, in a city, you need your professional sports clubs, you need your youth organisations, you need your community centres. There is so there is enough need, but we need to break down the barriers. What happens with some organisations is around competition. Competition of there are young people and there are not are young people. If we're truly about young people, we're all working behind improving outcomes for children, young people, not viewing them as a customer or a commodity. And that causes problems sometimes because People don't want to work together because they get worried about, well, whose young people are they? We should all be working together for collectively. And I, and I agree with Paul, the idea of a unisex child friendly city is something that everybody should be striving for because it gives you, again, another commitment to fall behind. Dagan, you've got your hand up. Far away. You've got your hand up. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, John made a very good point. Uh, you know, there is, I, I always emphasize the word inclusion because I'm, I, I work with uh, immigrant students and also I work with uh, semi-pro uh, athlete students. And the, the common point is they are in this mood that we can call as acquired resignation. Uh, so there are some roles attributed to some young people that such as you would never do something in your life because you come from an immigrant community. You can never achieve this because you come from this particular school, etc. Uh, so sport is actually a good way to, to break that sort of mentality because when a, a certain person, a young person is included in sport, it's, it's, it's their encounter with, with the institutions. It's their first encounter with the institutions, which include them. So there is this, there is this thinking, so I'm included here, so probably other institutions would take me too. I could be a part of the wider society. And it's very important because sometimes you have the mechanism to include those people, but people are so, uh, so feeling su such a mistrust because of previous experiences, they just don't, they don't believe. So sport is a good way to create that belief. And, and it, it, it can work wonders, really. I, I, in my academic and journalistic life, I've seen dozens of examples of this. Look, guys, um, fantastic. Thank you 
very much indeed to John, to Paul and to Dagan for those uh, wonderful contributions. Thank you for asking those questions as well. I mean, this is such a, a, a big topic. Uh, I think we could go on for hours and hours and hours. But uh, as always, uh, time runs away from us. Um, please do stay on this session, uh, listen in. Maybe you've got some questions you would like to answer as well. Thank you to everyone that's been submitting their questions. I've been looking through them. We've now got our, our second panel um, of contributors, and I will be looking back through the questions as well to put them to them. So uh, once again, thank you to Paul, John and Dagan. Let's move on then to our second evidence panel. And we're sort of branching out now onto the sort of health and well-being, uh, still focusing on, on levelling up, of course. Uh, and our next uh, contributor, we're actually staying at the University of Huddersfield, my local university. And we've got Leanne Azevedo. Uh, Leanne, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Apologies if I haven't. And you're a reader in health research. Leanne, thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, you pronounced it right. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, my area of research is actually public health and promotion of physical activity. But when I saw this opportunity highlighted by, by Jody in my university, I said that really relates well with a project that I have just completed doing an evaluation which is the Southeast Arts Project, um, or short uh, that we call STAR. So the STAR project was uh, a project that was implemented in September last year, just after the uh, children coming back from the COVID pandemic, and they promote dance in schools. So they had dance artists coming to school to deliver sessions twice a week to children in primary schools in uh, Middlesbrough and Redcar in two areas. There were uh, Grangetown, not sure if you're very aware about uh, the geography in, in Middlesbrough, but it's one of the most uh, private areas in, in Middlesbrough. Um, so they took part of this on these two weekly sessions for uh, the whole school year. They also attended a, a Pinocchio performance, a ballet performance from Pinocchio, and the children have done their own performance towards the end. Um, so we went there to do what you call like a, a qualitative study. So we did some interviews and focus groups with um, teachers, uh, parents, the dance artists themselves. Um, uh, and that, that was it. Yeah. Uh, so we for children, what we found is that they uh, reported being happy, having fun and being full of energy. However, the most interesting findings comes from you know, focus groups and interviews with teachers. Um, teachers at the beginning, when we, they, the project were implemented in their school, they're quite reluctant to accept it because they said, we are just back from, from lockdown. Um, we really need to catch up on the curriculum. We can't really deal with two days a week of sessions of dance in school. Um, so they were not very happy about that. And they also were concerned about um, the vocabulary that uh, the dance artists were using with the children. They said that they are pitching too high. Children can't really understand this, um, this type of way that the dance artists has been, have been communicating with the children. So anyway, we came back again towards the end uh, and teacher's opinion completely changed throughout the project. They actually noticed that children had improved their literacy skills um, and teachers were actually using dance uh, as examples to teach other parts of the curriculum, not just dance, they mentioned about arts in general to use uh, to teach other parts of the curriculum. Um, they also noticed that children were more engaged in class and less disruptive. Um, and they think that the most, the most important thing is that the artists were allowing children to express themselves without judgment. So that like kind of boosts that uh, confidence, creativity, um, and which really helped children in class too. Um, an interesting finding is um, the teachers were concerned about how boys would engage with dance because of the stereotype of dance being thing for girls. But uh, teen arts who delivered the project were quite clever. And at the very beginning, they brought uh, a male professional artist to talk with the children 
and they uh, that really changed their perspective because the artists talk about his career as a dance performance and how he traveled around the world. And for children who live in, in uh, the private area in Middlesbrough, that really changed their aspirations. And teachers noticed that actually the improvement on um, confidence and skills were more prominent on boys than it was on girls, especially because some of the girls were already doing dance elsewhere, but was kind of a new thing for boys. And they really, um, especially on the performance, they really overcome themselves and they saw there was also a good partnership between children to, to learn how to work as a group in the dance performance, which they haven't seen before in other activities. Um, so concerning the Pinocchio, which was another thing. Uh, so during the, this uh, year period, children went to um, a, a performance at the theater, the Pinocchio, which was just a ballet performance. So no talking throughout the performance. And teachers, again, were worried. I said, how my children will behave quietly watching a ballet for such a long time if all no talking, no communication, and so on. And she was really surprised again. Um, she said they really engaged well for some children. It was their first opportunity to go to a theater, uh, which was fantastic. And also towards the end, um, they had this to do their own performance. Um, children were very nervous uh, to do this performance um, because like, uh, and it was in a theater, in a proper theater. So they were uh, not confident, but at the end they did it. They did very well. A performance, they invited parents and uh, siblings uh, to come to this performance. Um, and one of the teacher mentioned to me, we usually don't have much to, to celebrate when we talk with parents, because it's usually like uh, on this parents evening that we just talk about uh, the children's grades on math and English, which are not sometimes very, um, something very rewarding. But uh, in this performance, they said it was a reason to celebrate and everybody was happy and nobody was judged uh, about, uh, they did what they did. Uh, they managed to express themselves, show the skills that they have. There wasn't much of a, a comparative or competitive structure on this. Uh, so actually the teacher at the end concludes saying that they would like to see this progressing on a scale um, in, in their area and maybe in other areas of the Northeast. Um, However, like all the projects, there are lessons learned. Um, they, we noticed that the intervention didn't work very well for the younger children year one, and they, it worked much better for the year five. Uh, the children for year one, they had to copy a lot of the behaviors from the artists and from other teachers and that kind of mirror. So it didn't really help them to show much of their creativity. So maybe this is something for another age. They also noticed that we there need better communication with parents and schools um, so they know what is happening because for some parents, I think probably, I know you have a teenager, children, I have a child too. Sometimes you don't know much what's happening in school. Children just come home and just uh, drag themselves to the sofa and that's it. So they think that there is a need to communicate better to see how these things are progressing and engage more the parents. But all overall, it was a positive experience that they want to see progressing uh, on a large scale. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Leanne. Um, you, you've certainly stimulated a, a, a few questions for me, which I'll follow up with a, a, in a moment. Um, and our second uh, panelist at uh, this stage is James Reeves from Football uh, Beyond Borders. And James, if you could just start off, I know you're going to do this, and just explain what Football Beyond Borders is all about, please, for those that don't know. Thank you, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, firstly, an apology. We were meant to be joined by one of our participants from Bolton, a young man called Tristan, who wasn't able to join us. And just to echo Paul's call, that I think it is really important to involve more young people in these discussions about the things that affect them and their future. Um, Football Beyond Borders is an education charity and social inclusion charity founded in 2014. Uh, we began working in London, but since 2019, we've been working in the Northwest. And now it's the region where we deliver most of our programs. We, del we work with around 1400 young people in schools every single week and a further 600 
on a more light touch basis. And around half of those are currently um, in the Northwest. We deliver 46 programs in the Northwest. Um, 31 of those programs are with boys and around 15 are with girls. What, what we do is we work in areas of socioeconomic disadvantage and we work with young people who are disengaged at school but passionate about football and we use sport as a tool to re-engage them with their learning and develop the skills and the grades necessary to transition into adulthood. Um, and it was really interesting listening to the discussions previously because I, I think I'm generally just going to echo a lot of the sentiments of what's already been shared. And I'm going to talk about sport as a means to support health and well-being by providing two things inclusion and long-term trusted relationships um one of FBB's main outcomes is to reduce exclusion in school and that's something that that uh, Dagan talks about at length like what are some of the reasons why young people are excluded from society and, and obviously school is part of that um, we believe that football is, is a really, really good tool for engagement and the evidence would suggest that for young people who perhaps don't engage in mainstream school that may have special educational needs, they do need to be approached in a slightly different way. So you can look at around 15% of the student population have some sort of special educational needs diagnosis um, and they're three times more likely to be excluded from school, four times more likely not to receive their GCSEs and around 18 times more likely to find themselves in custody age 16 to 18. And that's something that really needs to be subverted. And sport is, is one of the, the main ways that, that we try and um, yeah, develop social emotional skills, that, that sense of self-awareness, social awareness, managing and regulating your emotions, making responsible decisions. Um, and then building relationships with people and, and sport is very inclusive and one of the, one of the greatest tools to do that and, and our evidence would suggest that it works. Last year 97% of the young people on our programs weren't excluded from school. That kind of completely juxtaposes some of the narratives that you're seeing about young people who are, are vulnerable and, and that we're working with. Um, I'll now come on to talking about relationships and, and belonging. Um, Football Beyond Borders was founded on a foundational belief that football is one of the most, uh, I suppose, one of the best tools for building relationships in the world. And, and I'm sure listening to some speakers on the panel today that they would share that belief. Um, football be, uh, provides a, a safe space. It provides an, an area where young people can, can be themselves, where they can explore their own identity, but also where they can explore group identities um, there's a, a project that we run in schools called Squad Goals, where young people will reflect on, on their differences, on their similarities. And these are things that often young people aren't given the opportunity to do. And sport creates like a, a really valuable opportunity to do that. Leanne talked about dance as a tool for re-engagement in school. I think one of the things that we talk about as important, doesn't necessarily have to be sport, but as long as you can create environments where young people can develop and find their passions, and then utilize that to engage them in the curriculum, then that, that's something that, that achieves great success. Um, and, and I think, yeah, again, on relationships, onward last week, uh, the National Youth Agency Youth Work Summit released a report that apparently 12% of 18 to 34 year olds have either one or no close friends. That's really worrying because we know that the, the quality of relationships that people hold make them far more resilient to adversity in, in their adult life. Um, and, and so more of those spaces are important. I'm gonna reflect now on a, little, a few of the themes and, and things that came through earlier in the discussion, particularly around trusted adult role models, um, but particularly with uh, reference to, to what Dagan said around why, why are people excluded from sport or from society if, if, if those role models aren't there? It's largely because those role models one, there's not enough of them. Um, and two, that when they are in a position of support for young people, they don't have the training or expertise in order to support them properly. Cultural competency is really, really important. We have a wide range of cultures um, in our society, and it's important that, that youth workers and young people working with young people represent them. Uh, often there's like a mistrust of the system from young people from, from socioeconomic disadvantaged backgrounds. And we need to try and subvert that by improving recruitment into the sector and then providing the training and support to give those people the skills to support young people. 
It's also within a sporting context, it needs to be far less about technical development and more focused on developing passion for the sport. I've talked a little bit about our work with girls. None of our uh, programs will look to develop a young person's ability to ping a 50 yard pass out to their friend on the wing. No, it's, it's much more about creating inclusive environments where young people can play, where they can experience joy, where they can be praised and they can feel a real passion and engagement in something. Um, a few other comments that, that came through, we talked about relationships and trust and the holiday activities funding. That was brilliant and it was great to see the extra funding that that received due to Marcus Rashford's campaign. But re quality relationships aren't built in holiday programs. They're built over many years with trusted individuals. And at the moment, the funding that the voluntary and community sector receives don't resemble uh, uh, opportunities to do that. Often they're for programmatic funding delivered within one year rather than multi-year funding for core costs. It's really impossible to build long-term relationships without guaranteed job security for work, uh, youth workers over a number of years. Um, so we really want to join the National Youth Agency's call for, for 10,000 additional uh, youth workers and a review of the way that, that, that funding happens in the sector. Um, another thing that was talked about is the, the policy that by, uh, I believe it was Paul, about the policies and procedures that harm young people. Um, we'd love to see another review of the statutory guidance in line with some of the things that were outlined in the Timpson review and the special educational needs um, green paper, which haven't quite progressed at the speed that we would like to see. Um, so it'd be great to take another look at that. Um, and yeah, finally, just to finish um, before going into questions, just a, a summary that yeah, health and well-being can only be supported if the, the well-being of the people delivering that work is supported in the same way the health and well-being of the young people so we need to provide more support for youth workers and teachers who are working with young people in order to ensure that they can yeah progress and and, and um develop society in the way that we want to i'm going to finish with a quote from one of our practitioners sam um who's based in bolton uh he said the northwest created who i am cold resilient isolated at times but caring as well Everyone understands the pressures that we all face, be it lack of opportunities, lack of jobs, things like that. The power of youth work is to explain to a young person that it's OK to be vulnerable, that there's vulnerability based trust. I'm going to be vulnerable with you as a youth worker and you're going to be vulnerable with me as a young person. And that's when we can start talking about our issues. Thank you for your time. Uh, cheers, James. That was absolutely brilliant for, from, from both of you as well. Just to finish off that last point, um, lack of jobs, there are loads of jobs out there, but it's about matching up the young people with those opportunities and jobs and apprenticeships. I, I live and breathe uh, opportunities for young people. I've run four big jobs and apprenticeship fairs uh, in my patch. Uh, my two teenage, teenage daughters are one's looking at starting an apprenticeship neither are going to go to university in fact no one in my family has been to university my brother hasn't my dad hasn't I haven't um and my eldest daughter's just started working in retail in in the center of Leeds as well there are absolutely loads of jobs out there there are loads of opportunities but the big question is how do we give the young people the the, the chance to access them the confidence um, and, and the sort of skills or, or the experience or personality to be able to access them. There are loads of opportunities out there. Um, I, I could talk about this uh, for ages. Uh, in my two, two roles, I've been a recruiter. So in the Royal Air Force, I was in charge of RAF recruiting in the northeast uh, of England. I lived in Newcastle for two years. I was in charge of the careers office there. I interviewed hundreds of young people to join the Royal Air Force. Um, and what I liked about this session was, I wasn't looking at education ability, I was looking at character, uh, personality. I always asked them what they did in the evenings and at weekends uh, and just looked for talking points. And as I say, so many people that join the armed forces are, are people that have got involved in their community, uh, done scouts, done Duke of Edinburgh, done cadets. Uh, now it would be National Citizen Service, uh, Duke of Edinburgh's getting involved with, with, with your programme, James, as well. That's what I'm looking for. And now as a Member of Parliament, I interview people to work for me. And in fact, I've just taken on a, 
fantastic young man in my office here in, in Westminster. He had no previous experience in politics. He was just working in a Morrison supermarket. But I asked him about his character and his personality, and he'd been involved in cadets, and he just he was just very community focused. And do you know what? He's turned out to be probably one of the best employees I've had. He's absolutely brilliant because of his personality and character and his his willingness to learn. So I think that's what this is 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 all about, really. Um, you know, it's not about um, you know um, A stars or GCSEs or A levels. It's about giving these young people the opportunity for a ch chance to shine, really. There are so many opportunities out there. Uh, I've got fantastic engineering and textile companies, and they say to me, they've got the jobs and opportunities, but it's about finding the young people with the wherewithal, wherewithal and, and the character. Yeah, yeah. Can I come back on that, Jason? Just because I think it's a great point. And, you know, with the apprenticeship levy, uh, you know, the new level three apprenticeships, JNC degrees, all of this kind of stuff, there's so many opportunities being funded through local authorities. And a lot of these local authorities are going to have massive, massive underspend because people aren't accessing them. And I think that's the issue is not that they're not available, but why are young people not accessing these things? And I think it comes down to two things. One is exposure. And two is the sort of, the, the cultural representation um, that, that is really, really important. So I think the first thing is exposure. Young people aren't going to access a career or a, a route that, that they don't see um, placed in front of them, something that isn't exposed to them while they're at school. If they don't get an opportunity to try these things at least once to decide, you know what, that's for me. We talked about passion led learning. We need to develop young people's passions for these industries much earlier on. And the second thing is around yeah, cultural representation. If if I go into a, a job interview or a young person goes into a job interview with someone who doesn't sound like them and doesn't look like them and they don't see themselves being able to access that space, if it feels um, yeah restricted in any way, they're not going to do it. So I think those are the two things to your point that we need to kind of shift to ensure that those opportunities are taken up by young people. Yeah, uh, Leanne, I'll, I'll bring you in in a second. Please keep firing questions away in the chat button. We've got about 20 minutes to go. Um, uh, Leanne, I go to, you may know it coming from the University of Huddersfield. I go into Moor End Academy uh, a lot, which is in Crossland Moor on the outskirts of Huddersfield. Um, don't tell my other schools this, but it's one of my favourite schools um, because of the quality of young people uh, that they produce. Uh, there are 31 different first languages in Moor End Academy. It's in the heart of my Kashmiri Pakistani community. Um, and they've got youngsters from all over the world. Um, and do you know what? They don't get the best academic results necessarily, uh, but there are no needs at the end of it. Every young person has the opportunity to go on and get employment, go into an apprenticeship, go on to college. Um, but they engage with everything that's available. I've just jotted down some of the uh, schemes that they engage with, which I'll go in and visit with them. There's the BBC Journalism Week, uh, where they interview people, and they've interviewed me as part of, part of that. It's Parliament Week this week, and they engage with that, engaging with parliamentarians. Uh, Chance to Shine is the England and Wales Cricket Board uh, cricket programme uh, with a charity called Chance to Shine. Uh, where youngsters can sort of learn cricket skills and work together. They engage with National Citizen Service, which is the government scheme for 16 year olds, where you can actually go away uh, on a residential and then do a community programme. Uh, they engage with uh, the LTA tennis programmes that go in there. Um, they also engage with Restart a Heart programme, where they learn how to use a defibrillator uh, and, and save lives. Uh, they engage with so many different things. I don't actually know how they have time to to engage with them all. Leanne, you talked about um, the the curriculum and, and schools. Um, how do they find time for all these programs? Because I, 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 the challenge for head teachers being offered up all these programs, and we heard from Paul earlier saying going into schools, because head teachers are measured on the um, the league tables, aren't they? On their academic results. Yet we've got all these wonderful programmes that are being offered up that are a great benefit to their students, but don't necessarily help with their league tables. How do they get that balance right? 
Yeah, it, it's a challenge, but I, get, I think if you're both making a good point about exposure, how important it should offer this range of opportunity for young children and teenagers to um, to engage with the community, to engage with sports. And I think the school has this role of uh, um, linking somehow in the curriculum. It is challenging. Sometimes you have to do like after schools. Sometimes uh, my area, since it's more public health, I, I encourage a lot of physical activity for the health benefits. And I see the engagement in sports critical for engagement in physical activity throughout the life, which actually could improve uh, the health benefits in long term. Um, so sometimes teachers, for example, in primary school could embed like physical activity in the curriculum by doing classroom-based physical activity, teaching, for example, timetables to through um through jumping through through the numbers. So five times time, you have to talk, so jump 25 times. So recently one of my PhD students did one uh, intervention where they tried to embed uh classroom-based activity where you had teaching and physical activity inside the classroom, uh, which work very well. Uh, be, be, make better use of PE classes, for example. Uh, PE classes that sometimes become very bureaucratic about checking attendance and explaining lessons and the amount of activity that children do on that period is quite small. Extracurricular activities that you mentioned is, is, is critical uh, after schools, holiday clubs. And I think uh, there's the thing also that uh, J um, James mentioned about continuity and how important it is for children to be in a program that they can sing long-term and build relationship with other peers in that session and that what, how that could support them in long-term in their social skills, uh, for example. So th there are things like, and one thing that I always mention too, to head teachers, and there is quite a lot of evidence from, from the literature, is that by being more active doesn't mean that your academic achievement will decrease. Evidence show that actually it can improve or it can be stable, but certainly not uh, decrease their performance on the GCSEs or so ever. So being active would improve their well-being, will improve their health, and wouldn't impact their academic curriculum. So they shouldn't really try to reduce PE or other uh, sports activities throughout the curriculum in the benefit of uh, grades on school because that really doesn't work. And there is a lot of evidence coming throughout the world that show that. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring Paul in in a moment and, and James on this. Just a comment in the, the question bar, please keep the comments coming. I am reading through them. Philip Watson, for example, says the problem is schools do not prepare young people for anything after school and then employers do not commit to young people um, as to the jobs wh where they actually uh, are. And, you know, talking about sort of academic results. So my eldest daughter didn't do GCSEs, of course, because of the, of, of the pandemic. She just got the, the measured ones. But, you know, she's gone into the world of work. She's a trainee manager now in, um, you know, retail and on onwards and upwards. Very, very proud of her. Um, but, you know, at no point really is, you know, her grades sort of being, being assessed. It's about, you know, ability to learn and, and character and, uh, and, and personality. Um, thank you for all the comments that are coming through. Paul, you've jumped on here as well. I, I think my passion for this area has probably spurred you on as well, hasn't it? Um, yeah, massively. And I think so I put it in our chat. So, I mean, how we need to measure this is we need to change it. It's simple. We need to just change that measuring tool. There's a few real, this is not rocket science at all. It's so, so simple to change. But the thing about common sense is it's not that common. And we need people who are properly committed to making the change to do that. For me, it's simple. We need to change some of the education system. Whereas if you, in Scandinavia, you have a three-tier system, we don't have that system. Uh, I'm trying to change it from the inside out. That's why I got into this, to try and change and alter the education system slightly. That's why I still work in alternative provisions. That's why I still advise judges, chambers, police, local authorities, trying to let them look and see the problems that we're facing and why we're facing them problems. So that's, that's where I'm at. Common sense needs to be the approach. Yeah, James, do you want to quickly come in on this as well? You've been listening. Yeah, yeah. I think 
there's some valid points made. I, I, the one thing I would say is that the data sort of suggests at the moment that the most protective factor for young people leaving school is, is achieving their GCSE English and maths at the moment. But that doesn't necessarily mean to say that the system is right, but that that is that is is true. Um, there's there's, I suppose, yeah, adaptations that need to be made to the system, school system within that. There is some really good examples of good practice. I think if you look at school exclusions, as an example, I think it's something like 80 percent of school exclusions happen in 10 percent of schools. There are some schools where vulnerable young people are able to thrive and we need to look at those schools and those environments and the multi-academy trusts who are doing things really, really well, and then try and extrapolate that practice out to, and support in the areas, the cold spots, which John referred to, where it's not happening as well. I think schools are definitely a place that should be seen to be providing solutions rather than necessarily be framed as the problem within this. I think if you provide schools with, with the right support, we estimate it's around between an extra 1,000 to 1,500 pounds per vulnerable student, additional funding on top of the 5,000 pounds per student and mainstream funding they receive, that will enable them to, to provide the support that young people need. But um, yeah, at the moment, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big challenge that we're facing. Uh, I'm just looking through uh, some of the comments that are flowing in. Uh, James, obviously your comments uh, are called for 10,000 more youth workers. Um, um, somebody as well has asked for a link, Ed, uh, you asked for a link to the report that cited the statistics re young people and loneliness. Yeah, I've dropped that in the chat. Yeah, which, uh, which is really important. Thank, thank you for, for, for doing that. Um, I, I, I've been looking at some of the uh, education reports. There's actually, a, uh, we're, they're looking here in Parliament for a new chair of the Education Select Committee because Rob Halfen has become an education minister. Now, he's an absolute brilliant guy because he really focuses on vocational training and apprenticeships. So he's going to be a brilliant education minister. Um, but a lot of the people that are, are standing to be the new chair of the Education Select Committee uh, are talking about uh, vocational training, but also talking about the, I think it's nearly 90,000 young people uh, who have dropped out of education because of the pandemic. So uh, obviously they're not just missing out on their education, they're missing out on the opportunity to engage in, in sport and all the, the, the positivity that that uh, can bring as well. We've got about five minutes uh, left now as well. Leanne, I want to bring you back in as well. So we've got five minutes left. Um, we've had an hour and a half of this. What, what are your sort of overall reflections uh, and, and with a focus on the North as well? So you're the heart of the North. I am in Huddersfield. You know, what is specific um, about the North, the importance of this to Northern culture and opportunities for young people, do you think? OK, um, yeah, I, I think we need to, of course, invest in the North. We have all this agenda for the North and South divide. I heard also that there is more fun coming to the North for arts. Uh, so I think this call today is very um, appropriate because we can try to link sports with us in many ways that we have been discussing here and push this forward. Um, I think there was many things highlighted today about working with uh, academies and learning from academies that are doing right concerning um, engaging people, uh, young people into the community through sports and so on, and try to transfer the learning from this academy to others that are not doing so well. James highlighted the point that some of the uh, schools actually uh, have the most, uh, highest number of uh, exclusions. And so I think working with the ones that are struggling and, and share learning is quite important at this stage. So. Hopefully there will be more investment in the north. It looks like we, we, I'm not sure actually after Thursday, but um, uh, I think learning from each other and also learning in co-production, which is something that I wanted to mention too. Like for all the projects that I, I do, uh, although we read a lot from scientific papers and we try to apply what, what we learn from papers, is also sometimes it doesn't work. And when you go and try to apply it to the community, so we always try to speak with teachers, speak with pupils. I said, we have this idea, would it work? How we can adapt? 
And actually they, by engaging them from the start and having this co-production, give them more a sense of power of that's also their intervention, not just us coming as external and trying to deliver something to them. No, cheers, Leanne. Uh, J James, do you want to just a final few comments from you, particularly with a, a focus on the North? What's different about the North as compared to the rest of the country? Because we could be doing this session maybe in, in the Southwest. What, what are the opportunities for us uh, and, and, and why the North in particular in terms of Northern culture? I think in terms of cultural identity in the north it, it differs so much more over short geographical spaces there's such a wide variety of cultural identity in the north and i think that there means there's a greater pressure on on a range of opportunities and activities and a range of exposure and opportunities and, and different things because you have to cater to such a wide sort of net um so that i think for me would be the key thing from a northern perspective yesterday I was at St. George's Park with a group of young people from our, our Midlands programmes, not necessarily Northern, Northern in comparison to where I am in London at the moment. But um, I think, yeah, seeing the, the look on some of those young people's faces, just being able to um, explore their passion and, and go to a place that feels so far out of reach for them. Some of them had never left their, their home city or town. And I think exposure to those opportunities and, and experiences for young people in the North is, is imperative too. Uh, James, Leanne, thank you very much indeed. Paul, are we going to sing out on Let It Be? <laughs> Beatles. Oh, you, you, you take it away. Go on, Jason. You haven't, you haven't heard my singing. No, Paul, thank you very much indeed uh, for your uh, contribution. Uh, thank you to all our fantastic panellists. I think the last hour and a half of that has absolutely flown by. Uh, and in many ways, we've probably only scratched the surface, but it, it really is a an area that is so important uh, to Northern culture, but also for opportunities for young people. Just, just quickly on, on funding, we have sort of mentioned that, and I am a Conservative Member of Parliament. And do you know what? I am proud of some of the funding streams that we have got. We've talked about the Holiday Activities Food Fund programmes, which are then delivered by other groups and sporting organizations so sometimes people don't realize that it is government funding it's over 250 million pounds it's a massive commitment national citizen service ncs that's government funded you know where young people go on a, a residential course and then deliver a, a community program and then i think as james said there's dwp and home office funding programs as well um so sometimes it's not necessarily all just about funding, it's how it's, how it's actually delivered, how we access the young people, uh, how we partner up with other organisations. There is a lot going on, but I think it's about how we measure the success and, and, and how we identify those young people that perhaps are still missing out on opportunities. So thank you all very much indeed. I, I've really enjoyed uh, chairing this session. Uh, thank you to all our, our brilliant panellists uh, from across the North. I'm certainly going to be following up on a, a lot of the work uh, that you're doing. Uh, our next programme, if you want to just make a note of this, our next oral session is on the 14th of December, again at 10 o'clock. Uh, we've got a, a blockbuster uh, session. Not that we haven't had a blockbuster session this morning. Uh, we'll have Tammy Gray-Thompson and Olympic gold medalist Chris Boardman, uh, amongst others, uh, giving evidence. So please look out for that. Thanks again to uh, Sheffield University, our academic partner. Uh, thank you to all our panellists once again. Uh, and I look forward to uh, joining you soon. So uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, enjoy the World Cup. Uh, James, Paul, Leanne, keep up your great work. Uh, and let's hope this soggy weather stops soon. And let's hope Huddersfield Town get off the bottom of the championship. We're having a nightmare season. So good morning, everyone. See you soon. Thank you once again. Thanks, everyone.